Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at this monitor here. It's a Hitachi 12 or 13 inch monochrome security camera monitor. As is usual with CRTs on the, my channels, uh, this was actually a trash rescue. It was about to be recycled, and I thought, no, no, this thing needs to live. I have no idea if this thing works. I haven't turned it on, opened it up, done anything. But I gotta say, it looks to be in pretty well, I don't know, maybe okay shape. Can't quite tell yet. Now you might be asking, why would I be interested in saving a monitor like this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First off, of course, it's a CRT and I have an incredible soft spot for any kind of CRTs. But more importantly, when you look at monitors like this, you might think, oh, it's just another security camera monitor. But the reality is in the late seventies, when machines like the Apple II were first released and started selling pretty well, there were no consumer monitors out there on the market to hook up to your computer. The Apple II was designed with a composite video output that through an RF modulator, you could hook up to your TV. But of course, through RF, you're not gonna get really sharp text. And TVs, at least in the United States and Canada back then, didn't regularly have a composite video input on them. So people started using monitors like this, a little nine inch security camera monitor. And this one is from Koyo Electronics Industries. I found this at Goodwill a good number of years ago for a whopping $5. So in early Apple press material, they were even showing monitors like this. I think there was a Hitachi version that was sitting on top of the Apple II. And the cool thing is because of the small size of this little nine inch version, it could fit on the top of the computer with a couple of the disc drives and all fit in a really neat compact package. The other cool thing about these monitors is they're designed for, well, seeing what your security cameras are displaying as clearly as possible. So they're actually very high resolution. And this nine inch monitor here has no trouble showing 80 column text, 40 column text of course works as well, and the graphics and whatever very, very sharply. Now I knew at the time they had multiple variants of these monitors in both nine inch and the 12 inch form factors. And this Hitachi one is the 12 inch version that I've never actually seen in person because like I said, all the old computer pictures were always using these nine inch ones, probably because they were substantially cheaper than the larger versions. So the 12 inch version here has very similar construction to the nine inch versions as in entire metal chassis, it does have a carry handle on the top, which is kind of cool. And the same four knobs here with a power switch over on the left and well, a 12 inch CRT. On the front panel here, we have a power on off switch, the Hitachi Denshi logo, vertical hold, horizontal hold, and also the brightness control or black level control and contrast, which is typically a white level control, although it might actually be contrast on this monochrome monitor. Looking at the back of the monitor, everything is metal and solid as is typical with the security camera monitors. Looking closely at the back, we have these two coax type jacks. I don't know the name of these. These are kind of big and old and used in the seventies and were very quickly replaced with BNC jacks for security camera monitors. The one on the left, is in, the one on the out is out, it's a pass through, and then we have a selectable 75 ohm termination resistor in the monitor. Typically, the reason why this exists is you want to have the very last thing in the chain terminated to 75 ohms. So if you have an Apple II plugged into this directly and that's it, you want to make sure the 75 ohms is on or enabled. But if you're going to use the external pass through here to hook up another monitor or VCR or something like that, then you want to have this set to off or high impedance and allow the last thing in the chain to have the termination enabled. There it is, video monitor from Hitachi Denshi, model number VM129U, U for North America. And we have a curious asset tag here, property of international robomation intelligence. Is there anyone familiar with this particular company? I've never heard of it. And here's the manufacturing label from Hitachi. It does say Hitachi Denshi, Tokyo, Japan, manufactured in Sendai. And there is a date, January 1984. Now, I can assure you that while this is kind of a late date, this monitor was probably being made as is exactly like this for a good number of years before 1984. So one thing I'm gonna do in this video, by the way, is I broke out the old CRT tester, the Kony TR850, which is the same as a Sencor something or other that was sold here in the US. I'm gonna see how strong the CRT is even before we power this thing up for the very first time. So with all that said, let's uh, get something to hold the screws and let's start pulling the screws off the back of this thing. I'm noticing this screw here has a little bit of like paint or something in it, like it's been banged up against a wall, but just a little pick, got that out, no issue. Now curious is a few of these screws are extremely loose. 
I don't know if that means someone's been inside of this thing before, or maybe that's just from heat cycles, from being stored outside. Here we go. All right, well, on the back here, <laughs> that's not a good look, not a good look at all. I'm assuming water was pouring onto this thing at some point, but hopefully it stayed out of the inside of the monitor because there are no vents on the top. And yeah, you can see here where the water was pouring down and uh, this is, should be this way here. So yeah, water was coming down there and pooling up there and creating a bunch of rust. Luckily though, looking inside, I don't think that's gonna have any bearing because the PCB there is floating off some standoffs and all that's on this back panel here is just these coax jacks, of course the power cord input, and that's no problem. I can just replace those anyways. So I wanna get a view of the true extent of any corrosion that's in there. So this top cover needs to come off. Okay, you know what? This is a little bit different of a design than I'm used to. The CRT seems to be actually attached to this part of the metal chassis here. So I'm gonna take the neck board off here, just wiggle that off. Why are you not coming off? Ah, there's a zip tie holding that all on. Okay, with the zip tie cut, neck board comes off. It's a very crusty plastic zip tie. And on this neck board here, there is a ground lead that goes up to the CRT. We're gonna to have to unplug that. The deflection yoke on the CRT is connected to the little PCB here. So I just unplug that. By the way, keep in mind, do not work inside a CRT unless you know absolutely what you're doing and how to be safe. Now I've had this particular monitor for a while now and I've never plugged it in. So there's no way that anything inside here is charged, but the CRT itself is a giant capacitor and it can actually store a pretty big charge. So you have to be careful about that. But more importantly, if you're plugged into the wall here, we're talking about mains, 120 volts here in North America. Well, that can pack a real punch. And if you're living in a hundred or, and if you're living in a 240 volt country, of course, you don't wanna be just touching 220 volts or 240 volts willy nilly. This particular set uses an isolated design. So there's a giant transformer here that takes the mains, converts it probably to like 18 volts or 14 volts or whatever, something like that. And then that runs this little PCB down there. And then what's left is the high voltage anode cap, which is right here. It's a little hard to see because it's way in there, but it's where the red cable goes in. We're gonna have to unplug that because I'm gonna need to get this cover off here. And you can see the whole CRT is moving there. Well, it's obviously connected to that board. So on this particular monitor, it's the only way to get this thing apart. So I just use a little plastic tool to unhook that. There it is. Okay, so now with the CRT free, let me figure out how to get this thing apart. I don't really know what I'm doing here, but I just took the front knobs off, which seems to kind of free up this front panel a little bit. All right, I figured it out. The front panel here clips into the top metal chassis and you pull down on it. Let's see, I did it on one side. Let's try this side. There we go. Okay, and now it is free. Although the LED is still hooked up here, uh, which looks like it can not disconnect there. Hmm. The LED here is the style of the Commodore 64, which means you can pull this clip out and then pull the LED out. It's actually soldered onto the board right here, so there's no way to easily remove that. But I think this should be free now. Yes, it is. Okay, so there we have it, the electronics. I wanted to see how bad the corrosion looks. Okay, it's um, not great, not great at all. I just realized this LED connection does appear to be a connector of some kind. Looks like one of the clips is broken on it, but there we go. So I could have just disconnected that to remove this front bezel <laughs> a little more easily. Okay, so there's the metal chassis. You can see that, um, well, there's quite a bit of corrosion in here. Looks like it dripped in the back and then ran along the side here and towards the front. But really lucky for us, this corrosion here does appear to be mainly cosmetic. The transformer is a sealed unit, so it's almost certainly in perfect shape. And the entire main board here was held up on standoffs, like there and there, and there's a couple on the bottom there, which means that it is probably fine. Looking at the topology of this board, it's all pretty run of the mill stuff for a monochrome screen. So the video signal comes in here on this wire and there's a little bit of active stuff here, transistor or whatever. And then it actually makes its way through this cable right here over to the front side of the board here where these controls are for brightness and contrast. Somewhere there's gonna be a sync separation circuit. It's either over here, but it's probably over here actually where the sync signals go into the rest of this stuff here for the horizontal and vertical drive and whatever to drive the CRT drive the flyback transformer. But then the video circuitry here is processed through those controls and then goes over this coax cable up here. 
and makes its way through that coax over to the neck board where there's some more processing for like cathode drive and stuff. And then it goes into the CRT. We have a switch here. I'm not sure what that does. And then we have a couple controls on the neck board for focus and screen. Almost certainly that's what those are. We have a transistor right here labeled Q151. This is almost certainly the final stage of the cathode drive for the CRT. The reason why to put it on the neck board here, which was a very common tactic on especially later VGA monitors that required a very high resolution, is the closer it is and the, le the less number of wires you go over, the sharper the image is gonna be. Because a 12 inch CRT used in this set can resolve a higher resolution up to 700 lines, according to uh, the service manual, they want to put this stuff as close to the CRT as possible. On a nine inch one, it doesn't matter quite as much. So it would be potentially on this board. Although I looked at the service manual for this particular monitor and it seems that the nine inch version and the 12 inch version use the same uh, main board here. I'm pretty sure there's almost no difference or, or very little difference. Now, one thing we can see here, there's the high voltage anode connection and the flyback here is there is a good amount of the black soot there, and that comes from use. It is attracted to the high voltage that's generated by the monitor. If it's a very, very low hour set, it's not gonna have that, although it could be a high hour set and used in an extremely clean environment, and it may not have as much of that, although you're still gonna have some of that because I think no matter how clean it is, there's still a little bit of stuff in the air that gets attracted uh, by the high voltage here. See, it's on my finger there. Luckily, as I mentioned, this entire monitor service manual is online, which means repairing this thing shouldn't be difficult. And I have to say at first glance, everything on this board is looking in good shape. I don't see any leaking capacitors or any other issues that really stick out to me. Ideally, of course, if I were gonna be totally restoring this thing, we'd wanna strip this thing down and I would uh, clean off this rust or corrosion here and then try to cover that up with some kind of inhibitor to prevent it from rusting anymore. Although now that this thing is out of its hostile, damp environment, it's probably not gonna be much of an issue anymore. This is like an anodized type of metal here. I don't know what that coating is called. It's sort of got a gold look to it, with a little bit of rainbow thing going on. So this isn't just standard horrible rust like we saw on, I think, what the back cover. It's just kind of the plating coming off or something. This particular set has an NEC picture tube, 31 centimeters, it's model 31 OFRB4. So I'm pretty sure this is like P4 phosphor, I think it is. Is that the black and white, sort of the bluish color phosphor? And even though it's an NEC part number on a Hitachi monitor, it does say right here, this should have 31 OFBR4, which I'm pretty sure is what's in here. Now, if this CRT is totally worn out, I can do a tube swap. But remember, the things you have to keep in mind when you're doing a tube swap is A, it needs to be the same size, so 31 centimeters for this monochrome picture tube. And the mounting tabs on the CRT need to be in the same position as your new donor CRT. So the mounting tabs on this one or towards the back of the CRT, this metal band here is called the implosion band, and these need to be in the same position. I happen to have a donor CRT. This is a green 31 centimeter CRT. And looking at the mounting tabs, they look like they should be completely compatible. If it turns out that the CRT is completely worn out and really dim, then I'm probably gonna try to swap this green one in. Even though it's not the correct CRT for this chassis, it's all I got. It's not like CRTs grow on trees anymore, right? For connecting to my CRT tester, this is the cable here. Uh, this is obviously not just gonna plug straight onto that. I need an adapter. And then what I ended up doing is taking one of the adapters that I'd never used, this Linea one here, and I added some cables to it with connectors. So this can connect up here like so. And then I made an adapter that has the correct connector that goes on this CRT and then has the right cables here to plug in. Now the CRT tester is designed for color tubes, but that's fine. All we need to do is connect it up to the red cable here. And with all this connected, we are good to go for testing. So just carefully get this thing onto here. And I have the tester here on my trash can. This is a low production quality video. First thing I need to do is make sure I have the filament voltage set correctly. And it's this switch right here. This thing supports two filament voltages, 6.3 volts and 12 volts. Well, I know that all the monochrome CRTs here are 12 volts, so I'll set this to 12 volts. I will turn the cutoff down. We're gonna turn the tracking controls all the way down, put this thing into cutoff mode, and we'll power this up. And you won't be able to see on camera, but I can see that the filament is glowing if I look through the end of the CRT into it. So let's start on this thing with shorts. And if anything lights up here, it means there's a short inside the CRT and it's looking okay. Now we'll set the cutoff and typically these CRTs need a 600 volt cutoff voltage. And because this is a black and white CRT, I only have the red hooked up to the cathode. This is the one I'm gonna look at. I'm gonna turn the cutoff 
till the needle is right on the cutoff line and I'm looking straight down on it. So it is there, which is good. It's actually able to get cut off. When the CRT is super worn out, you try to adjust cutoff and the needle doesn't even move or barely moves. Now, if you're ever using a tester like this and you want to let the CRT kind of bake, as in you warm up the filament like we're doing right now, it's at 12 volts, and you wanna let it sit there to kind of try to bring it back to life. And what I'm talking about here is it, it seems that when CRTs are kind of well used and then they haven't been turned on in say 30 years or 20 years or whatever, the CRT actually doesn't really work that well. Like it just sort of is dim and doesn't look super great. And you can see that if the monitor works and you just turn it on, you'll see the image is kind of bleh. And then after some time of just running, it actually kind of comes back to life. Well, that can actually be evident on the tester as well. And leaving this thing set to cut off here is not driving any current through the cathode. All it's doing is really warming up the filament. Now, if we switch over to emissions test here, there it is. The emissions aren't terrible. The needle's sort of up in the middle here. Now, this is what I'm talking about that you don't wanna leave it on this mode because this actually is driving a whole bunch of current through the CRT. So if I push emissions test right now, we are currently at 0.5678, a little bit above 0.8 volts, I guess, or whatever the measurement is on this. And I'm just gonna let this sit here for 20 minutes and let's see when we come back if it's a little bit better than that 0.8. While we're waiting for that other CRT to bake in the oven to see if the emissions go up, I want to do an experiment with this other green CRT, something I've never done before and I thought might be kind of interesting. Using my LCR meter here, I want to see if this thing actually registers a particular value for capacitance. Yeah, you heard me right. I want to see what size of capacitor the CRT actually measures at. Will it be something that's so big that this thing won't even be able to measure it or will it actually work? First off, I'm going to set this to 100 hertz. So really this is as simple as connecting the positive lead into the anode connection here. And I'm gonna connect the ground lead onto one of the ears here, which is the negative side. And let's see what happens. It currently has a capacitance of 212 picofarads. I have no idea if this is an accurate way to measure anything. I switched over to ESR and it says the ESR is 75 kilo ohms. It's changing quite a bit here. I just want to make sure I have a good connection here. Yeah, 113, 90 kilo ohms, 178 picofarads. And we can change the frequency. So at one kilohertz, we're getting four kilo ohms, 176 picofarads, 10 kilohertz, 175 picofarads. And we have 100 kilohertz, which is the highest this thing can go. 28 ohms, 178 picofarads. <laughs> I don't know. There we go. So I have no idea if that measurement I just did was accurate in any way, but perhaps if you're talking about whatever, 178 picofarads at 10,000 volts, that's still a decent amount of charge that this thing can actually store. So this thing's been baking for a while. Let's see what we get now when we hit emission test. Oh yeah, we have an improvement. I know it's gonna be hard to see, but I'm gonna say that we're at about 0.95 now. So we're just under the one. So an absolute improvement. In fact, we should go back to cutoff here and I should reset the cutoff. Cutoff was still pretty good. And we go back to emissions test. Okay, adjusting the cutoff, it does change the emissions. And now when we go to emissions test, yeah, we're getting 0.9, but still an improvement. And I'm gonna say with the CRT looking like that, it should have a pretty decent image actually, decently bright that is. This tester has a button here that's labeled life test. And when you hold that down, I think what it does is it reduces the heater voltage from 12 volts to something lower, like maybe seven volts or eight volts. And you wanna watch how the emissions needle drops during that test. When the CRT is really strong and really good, lowering the heater voltage from 12 to say seven or eight volts, it doesn't necessarily drop the emissions very much. Although at this point, when I'm holding that down, we're down at 0.5, but you let go and the heater should warm back up again, which should restore us or turn us back to that 0.9-ish that we were getting. It's slowly raising up there, it's at 0.8. So yeah, it's creeping back up. All right, well, I think what we've determined is that the CRT on this thing is actually in pretty good shape. It's not super duper worn out and we should actually get a decent image. For the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna install this RCA jack, it's a panel mount type, into the back of this monitor. There was a blank plate right there and I just took the screw off. And what's odd is underneath the blank was this. Seems to have been two extra connectors on the back of the monitor with another switch for external sync in and out. 
wonder what that's all about. It would be like a composite video signal without any sync information. Does anyone know if that was a typical thing back in Japan in the old days? Maybe a like a Luma sync type signal, like a two wire system? Either way, there's this little blank here, which is um, pretty thin actually, which is perfect because I can uh, put the RCA jack in there and then put this back together and install this in the monitor. All right, there it is. RCA jack is installed and I rewired the connector. So only the RCA jack is in play now, although the 75 ohm enable and disable switch is still working. I can hear people asking the question right now, why did I disable these jacks? Well, the reality is these are just very unusual jacks that I don't even really have the cables for. I went into my spare parts and I did find an adapter that goes from this, whatever this is, to BNC. But the reality is I'm gonna be using this with 8-bit computers, so an RCA jack is just easier and better, and I'm never gonna use the pass-through anyways. As far as the rest of this thing goes, it looks like it's ready for testing. Even though there's a lot of corrosion in here, it hasn't really affected any of the wires and all the controls look okay. So other than some deox that we might need in some of those pots there, let's hook up the CRT, see if this thing works. I can't deny that testing this thing in place is a bit of a pain because, well, I have to make all these wires stretch and well, let's just see if I can do that. It is absolutely essential when you're reconnecting these cables that you get the ground lead reconnected. Do not power it up without that connected. Well, everything should be connected. So I'm just gonna slide this forward a little bit so I can access those controls. Just twist that. And I'm ready to connect up the power. And remember all the same warnings I mentioned earlier, don't do any of this unless you know absolutely what you're doing. All right, here we go. I hear high voltage. Good sign, everyone, good sign. These controls are not frozen, so that's also a good sign. All right, so turning that up, we can see some kind of raster. And I'm gonna say that this CRT is pretty tired, everyone, pretty tired. On the other end of this RCA jack, I have my pattern generator. So I'm gonna connect this up to the RCA jack on the back. All right, we do have an image and it is rolling. Oh, it stopped rolling. That's interesting. All right, so I switched over to convergence and yeah, okay. Uh, things are looking pretty rough here. Oh, wow. Yeah, talk about blooming. Uh, this control here definitely is very scratchy. So I'm gonna use some of this contact cleaner here to clean inside that pot. And now things are pretty clean, little deoxit fader lube, which has a nice lubricant in it. All right, here we go again. Let's turn this back on. I don't expect anything to be dramatically better. The CRT is definitely a tired CRT. So if I turn this all the way up, brightness and contrast, we're getting a relatively bright raster. Problem is, it's blooming so badly, everything looks completely blown out and super blurry. Now, this is not a focus problem. This is just the CRT being overdriven dramatically. And you can tell because if I turn those down, I know it's very dim on the camera, but the raster is quite sharp now. It seems that these security camera monitors always have a lot of headroom available to really crank up the brightness and the contrast, probably because if you're looking at a camera feed that's dim and you really wanna see what's going in, you're only gonna turn the brightness and contrast up to see that, but then you hopefully turn them back down when you're not cranking it to uh, the maximum. Now, I do notice there's some geometry issues as well. It looks like it's all squished in a little bit, but there are probably some controls on that little PCB that allow us to adjust those. But one thing that is 100% apparent to me is even though we tested this on the CRT tester and things seemed okay from an emission standpoint, clearly this is not what I would call a good quality image. It's an image, but it's not sharp and this would not be suitable at all for using with a computer. Now I can hear people asking, what about those two controls on the neck board, those two pots on there? Let's try adjusting those. Okay, this one doesn't seem to do anything because it's probably focus control. This one doesn't do anything either. Interesting. They are actually labeled. This one here says sub brightness. So let's get this pot here. And this one says focus. Put them through the range of their motion. These might be broken for all I know. Like sometimes these pots go bad. 
And I just hit them with a little bit of fader lube. Oh, they're working very smoothly now. Alrighty, let's see, did that make any difference whatsoever? Yeah, the sub brightness pot doesn't seem to work properly. Oh, I suppose unless that switch has something to do with anything. Hmm. I am reaching back here with a small tool to try to flip this switch here. Okay, did that make a difference? Oh yes, look at that, that does make a difference. Okay, that must bypass the uh, brightness control. All right, well, anyhow, this CRT is toast. It might be fine if you were just watching a crappy black and white video camera feed, but definitely this isn't gonna work for my use case. So I think we're gonna have to do a CRT swap on this thing and uh, I don't know, try that green CRT in here, yeah. Now really, the problem is, is the CRT is spent. And that's why the tester is just, uh, I gotta tell you about the CRT testers. They can give you false sense of like goodness. And they can also give you a false sense of badness. You can have a CRT that looks really bad on the tester, but actually works okay in real life. So I'm just gonna remove the uh, deflection yoke here first. Because we definitely need to transfer that over to the new CRT. And for discharging, this is what I'm gonna use is my high voltage probe. So I'm gonna clip this on to the ground strap that goes across the CRT. You don't wanna clip onto something like the metal of the chassis. Even though the CRT is connected to that, you absolutely positively need to make sure that you are just discharging the capacitor that is the CRT. And you just don't wanna have it running through circuitry like the ground wires and stuff like that. Clipping it right onto the CRT, like one of the ears or if there's a ground strap like there is on this one, that's what you do. So let's get this under there. Does this have any voltage in it? No. Nope, it discharged itself. Okay, there we go. What I like about these as well is it has this metal clip on there and you can use that to unhook the anode cap as well. Plus, of course, the fact that that has a meter on it to show you the high voltage, it gives you validation that you have properly discharged the CRT and there's no more high voltage. All right, so let's slide out this chassis. Now, while I take this out, let's talk a little bit. I've talked to people before who had CRTs that had pretty dim and blurry picture like this one did. And they were like, oh, I'm just gonna recap it and that's absolutely gonna fix it. And I told them, that's not gonna fix it. What's wrong with your CRT after, you know, they explained it and they sent me some videos or whatever. What I said is what's wrong with your CRT is the CRT itself is just spent. CRTs are absolutely consumable items. They have finite lifespans. And when that life has been used up, that's it. That's all she wrote. It's just gonna get dimmer and dimmer and you're gonna have to turn it up more and more. And since a CRT is an analog device, you can keep turning it up and you know, it will make it look decently bright again. But the reality is, think of the blurriness that we were looking at there as a distortion. It's not a perfect analogy, but if you're thinking about an amplifier, you can turn it up and it's louder and it's louder and louder and it still sounds really good, but you get to a point where you have diminishing returns and you can turn it up more and maybe it gets a little bit louder, but it also starts to distort. And eventually you can start to hear the distortion and it becomes distracting, right? It's not, not a fun time. Now, if you're a musician and you're a guitar player, maybe you want that distortion on your amplifier to sound you know, grungy or scratchy or whatever, and you like that, that's one thing. But when we're talking about a CRT that we want an image to look clear, especially if we're trying to display some text or whatever, like from a computer, then unfortunately that distortion just results in that blooming, that blurriness this is what we saw when we had the brightness and contrast turned up. So swapping out the CRT for a much better one, oops, we're getting some washers that are falling off. Oh, things are falling everywhere. But anyways, as I was saying, so swapping it out for a better performing or a less worn out one is the trick to making this monitor work well again. So I need to transfer this thing over, this little, uh, ground strap here. It does have a spring here, so we can kind of get this over the ear like that. And pull this off. We'll just stick it up here right now. Incidentally, I did write emissions 0.9 on here, which is the best we ever got. But well, <laughs> that wasn't very helpful because this thing, unfortunately, is toast. And here is the green one, which incidentally, I measured the emissions of this. I did it off camera and it was 1.0. But when I hit that life test button, 
the needle barely moved. It didn't even move at all. It moved the ever so slightest amount. But remember on that other one, the dead one, when we hit the life test, it moved a lot. It went down to like 0.5. Also, to set the cutoff on this, I had to just barely turn the knob, and that was compared to that one over there. You turn the cutoff way up. All right, well, let's get this back on. I kind of like how this works because there are these studs here. And let's think about the way this has to go because the high voltage anode connection needs to be on that side. So we'll slide this onto here. And, oh, I just realized I forgot to put the ground strap on. Oops. Shoot, the washer just flew off into nowhere. I'll have to find that washer in a second. So yeah, ground strap goes on. Make sure it's on this part of the CRT. This is the dull area. This is the DAG or the DAG ground. And this is basically part of the ground of the capacitor that is the CRT. Well, I just spent like five minutes looking for that washer and it was nowhere to be found. So I went into my little parts thing there and found a different washer. All right, we'll just do the final tightening. That's good enough. All right, we turn this around and let me hook the chassis back up. I just had a realization as well that the bottom chassis here normally is grounded at this top part where the CRT is mounted into, and it's not right now. I mean, I did hook up the ground lead here to the neck board, so I'm just gonna run a clip lead here from the DAG ground of the CRT. So that's that wire that goes across it onto the chassis here. So just in case, shouldn't matter, but just, just to be safe. Moment of truth, I'm just gonna turn the brightness and the contrast all the way down. Here we go. I heard high voltage. Ah, even with it all the way down, it is freaking bright. So I'm gonna to try to turn down the sub brightness on the neck board. There we go. And luckily there's enough range in that. So, cause even though these controls are all the way down, it should be totally dark right now. And there we go. So that's, uh, well, yeah, that's pretty bright. Okay, let me hook up the video signal. Where's the cable? Ah, here it is. Let's get this connected up. All right, so there it is. And yep, just like I thought, <laughs> that is so much brighter and it's actually sharp. It is actually freaking sharp, yep. So there's the focus control back here and doesn't really seem to do anything. Let me bring up a different signal for testing that. All right, focus control. So this one here has a very minimal effect on the focus, but it seems like in the middle for this CRT, it's the right setting. Well, one thing I can say for sure, this green CRT is nice and strong and has a really good looking image. The other CRT that we took out, not so much. How's this look when we turn it off? Oh, interesting how the turn off is different as well. The other one had that kind of bright thing in the middle and this one just sort of blanks out. So clearly we have some geometry issues. Now looking at the controls here, now this is powered up, so I'm not gonna touch anything. We have B plus adjustment here. So don't touch that. That's the main voltage the whole set runs at. We have a vertical height control right there. And then this thing, which I'm touching with the tool, is the width control. And you have to adjust that with a plastic adjustment tool like this. So that goes in there. It's got a ferrite core, and then you can turn this thing. So the reality is we should probably get the front bezel on, but this is absolutely having an effect here, and it is shrinking the picture down. When you use this tool to turn that with coil, that's actually a little slug that's inside of a coil and turning it actually moves it in and out. So it only has a finite amount of range and it seems like we're almost at the edge of the range here. So this is probably as narrow a picture as we can get on this particular set. Okay, and now we're gonna try adjusting the height. Ah, oh, yeah, that moves a lot better now. Oh, look at that, it made it roll, that's interesting. Huh. So if I have it shrunk like it is now, it's turned all the way to the left. Picture doesn't roll, but if we turn it up to the right, it starts to roll. Luckily, we have a vertical hold control, which we could still lock it in. There we go. Well, wow, <laughs> this is looking so, so much better. All right, so the next thing is, is I have the brightness control on the front turned all the way to minimum. So I need to turn this control on the back here to turn this down a bit. Okay, that's turned all the way down now. And this is turned all the way down. Wow, so that means this CRT has so much life in it, I had to minimize the sub brightness and the brightness control, well that's minimized there, to actually uh, get a suitable, not overdriven image. 
but it looks good and there's a lot of headroom. Lots of headroom here, yes. Gotta say, that is freaking awesome how good that looks. <laughs> and from a test pattern perspective, this is really good too. This thing has good circuitry in it. So I just wanna be able to see these uh, dark lines down here. This is NTSC and I can. And the picture looks great because you can use this contrast control to kind of adjust the overall brightness of the entire image. They do play off each other a little bit. That, that right there looks really good. Now that toggle switch on the back for 75 ohms, by the way, it's on 75 ohm mode right now. If I switch it, oh yeah, it blows out the whole image. So that's the way it should be. And this all goes back to what I was saying earlier is the way that that other CRT looked super blurry and defocused. That was just because it was incredibly worn out and we had to crank everything up on this thing, like the sub brightness on the back all the way up and right here. And that just overdrove the tube. It caused it to bloom, which is like that distortion on the audio amplifier I was talking about. This one on the other hand is in great shape. And I think I know why, because I'm pretty sure this came from Tin Linder. And he said that this was from an old Radio Shack employee. And I think this was a spare CRT from a TRS-80 Model 4. And it probably was never used. It was just like new old stock or very minimally used. So yeah, that's why this thing looks so freaking great. And just like any type of consumable item, like even the backlight on your LED TV, you shouldn't crank it at maximum. It's just gonna wear out those LEDs. So turn that contrast control or picture control on a Sony TV down, that's the white level, so that it's not eye searingly bright and that's just gonna make it last a lot longer. Same goes for televisions. If you find an old CRT TV that still looks really good, go into the menu and usually those things are cranked way up. Turn that picture down so it's an acceptably bright image and looks good, but not super eye searing. If you think about TVs especially, but you know monitors as well, they were designed to work in bright offices and bright rooms. And because of that, they needed to have that headroom where you could crank it up. But let's be honest here. These things are finite resources on earth. So don't overdrive them, turn them down and use them in dimmer rooms. And that just will help these things last for much, much longer. All right, enough soapboxing from me. Let's put this thing back together and see it in operation with an actual computer. All right, there it is, all back together. Cleaned it up. All that corrosion is still hiding on the inside, but you know what? I think it's gonna be just fine in there. So for testing, let's use the Apple IIc, just because I happen to have this computer sitting here. First, I'll turn on the monitor. So there it is, pilot light is on. For powering the IIc, I'm gonna use this USB power bank, and I'm gonna use a USB type C power delivery to a DIN cable that I made. These types of power delivery cables negotiate the output power and this power bank will power up and it will tell me right there that it's running at 12 volts, which is all you really need for an Apple IIc. And we turn this on and there it is, looking awesome. Now, one thing about the Apple IIs that's funny is the image is typically shifted over to one side. Luckily, this thing actually allows you some amount of movement here. Now it's still not perfectly centered, but I'm gonna say that's good enough for government work, as they say, uh, for using the Apple II. Well, one thing I was just trying to do was trying to figure out how to lock the exposure and um, couldn't figure that out on this camera, this Sony camera. I haven't had it super long, but it's not obvious how to lock it. And that's kind of frustrating. So for now, we're just gonna have to deal with some changes in exposure. So for instance, if I reboot the computer into the diagnostics mode, yeah, it's going to get dimmer. But as you can see here, hopefully it's coming across in the camera. I do have the focus in manual mode. It looks rock solid. So if we exit out of this and we go to PR number three, so we're in 80 columns mode, there is the 80 column text on the Apple IIc. Yeah, that looks, that looks wonderful. What's really awesome is that this is extremely bright and extremely readable. So this would have been not something we ever would have gotten out of that other original CRT on this monitor. And the sharpness that this monitor exhibits, which was also shared with its nine inch version, and I think the ones from the other companies, is the real reason why these things were prized and used on these old machines, because they just made excellent, excellent text displays. Now we know what we have to do. I need to boot up Fat City, my favorite test game for, uh, <laughs> for running on these Apple II machines. Yeah, that's normal. On the 2C, it seems to always do that. 
Yeah, <laughs> those awesome vertical lines, the hallmark of Apple II graphics. What's really good about this monitor as well, boy, you can hardly see my fingers there because of the bright green background there, is that whether you're displaying a full white screen or just a little bit of text, it doesn't seem to change the brightness and the contrast settings like a regular black and white TV does. I don't know the right terminology to explain this, but I've shown this on the composite modded black and white TV that I had, that depending on what was displayed on the screen, it would actually change the way the brightness setting was. So when you had things adjusted correctly for a screen like this full of white, when you just displayed a few words with all black background, then the background itself would sort of have, well, I would say it would look gray, but of course it would look kind of a greenish color, and you'd need to turn down the brightness knob on the set to make it look correct. But then if you went back to this screen, it wouldn't look so good anymore. And I think that all has to do with the way that the cathode drive couples the signal into the cathode. And this thing just does a much better job at that, or it's more suited at least for computer display like this. As an aside, in case you're wondering how much power the 2C is drawing, it is currently drawing 9.6, 8.4 watts, 8.4 to 9.6, it jumps back and forth. So not a lot of power <laughs> for this 2C. Of course, when the disk drive accesses, let's uh, run the disk drive here, it's 20 watts there, it went up to 20 watts. But yeah, pretty cool, right? That you can power your 2C and make it totally battery powered from something like this. And in case you don't believe me, if I unplug this, the computer is now off. And for the final configuration, we have the Apple II clone that I worked on so much and the monitor sitting on top kind of looks perfect. Let's turn the computer on. Hopefully it still works. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, look, I have the diagnostic ROM running. So this is interesting. The video output on the clone is so much dimmer than it is on the 2C. That's fascinating. No problem though, we can just turn up the brightness. All right, so there is a toggle switch on the back of this machine. So I can just put it back into normal mode. There it is, Apple II, the machine booted. I can also boot smart port devices. So I have that connected with total replay on it. And there it is, it freaking works. And it looks good as well. There's load runner, let's hit enter to run this. This thing is just great. This is a great monitor. I'm so glad to have saved this. I'm a little sad it doesn't have the white screen anymore, but I think the green still looks good. And for a computer monitor, yeah, I mean, look at that. <laughs> the game is running and it's perfect. Now, if we power cycle this computer, I do have an ED column card in here and it is connected with the auto switch module. So we type PR number three. Aha, so the AD column card has a quite a different looking video signal on it. So we have to turn down the brightness there. So that's uh, appropriate. Now that particular difference is not something in the monitor. That's actually something on the auto switch card that's inside this computer. It switches between 40 column and 80 column mode. So that is something that you can adjust. There's a potentiometer on there. Cause now if I hit, uh, yeah, control reset, we're back here and it looks pretty dim but back to there, the 80 column text is looking really good and it's syncing really well to that signal, which is awesome. And the text of course is nice and sharp and looks freaking fantastic. It's also nice to know that this clone machine is working. Anyhow, that is gonna be it for this video. So that is the kind of restoration of this Hitachi 12 inch monochrome monitor looks perfect on top of these old 70s computers. So I'm really glad to have this, not to mention, I love the square boxy shape of this thing with the metal chassis. And of course, you can stack a monitor on top of each self, like you can put another monitor on top of this, and there's plenty of strength in this metal case to hold it up. So you won't have any issues with plastic cracking or the top of the monitor not being flat, so you can't stack them. So it's really good when you have too many CRTs like I do, and you need to figure out storage methodologies and stacking is a really viable one. So yeah, that's another benefit to these monitors. But look how awesome this looks. And yeah, I'm super, super happy. And I'm so glad to have saved this thing. And hopefully watching this video, you'll learn a little bit about how these things work and doing a CRT swap. And the fact is, these things don't grow on trees. And if you can save another monitor to the world, even if you don't want to use it, save it and find someone to give it away to. That is the right thing to do because someone out there is gonna wanna play on a CRT or use a CRT and there's just no more of these being made anymore. 
So if you like this video, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Subscribe if you haven't already. That really helps me on the second channel, well, both channels especially. A lot of people watch, they're not subscribed. It'd be sweet if, um, you know, you just watch it, you just click that button. It only takes a split second. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen over here. They support me and allow me to do this full time. So a huge thank you to them. It was life changing for me to be able to do YouTube as a full time thing. And my patrons are what make it all possible. So if you want to become a patron and show some support for the channel, you can do so. Link in the description below. There are perks for being a patron and, you know, it's all on the Patreon page. I won't go into those now. So that is going to be that. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time. So stay healthy, stay safe. Goodbye. Wow, I messed up that outro. Bad. Okay. Bye.